Welcome, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for joining our Learn the Science Act Early Diversity session um, today. We are recording today's session, so if you have not taken a minute and um, noticed that and you want to stay on, your, we use the recordings to help with educational and quality improvements. They are on our Canvas page, um, so you can go back and review the sessions at a later date. Every time I move my thing, it moves, makes it so I can't move forward. Um, if you can take a minute, please rename your profile. Um, it helps us know who's on our call, um, where you guys are from, and just to be able to connect with everybody. Um, there is a way to raise your hand if you have any questions or need help with anything in the, today's session. We are going to be doing a case presentation today, and we're going to be talking about different things. If you ever have any questions about cases or um, want to ask anything with our who's on our call, just remember to avoid using first, middle, or last names. Don't try not to identify um, that we would be able to easily access that. If you have any questions, just reach out to one of us and we'll be able to answer those questions. Um, the key, key components of an ECHO session are, of course, um, just building that community of practice, knowing who works in the same field as us, has some of the same issues. Um, we do have a didactic speaker, and then we do a case presentation and a time for feedback. Uh, case studies are a great way to share information about situations, real life cases that we are struggling with, um, and getting information and recommendations from colleagues and coworkers. So if you are interested in taking a minute to do a case presentation, please just reach out to us at earlyecho at usu.edu. I've done those on families that I have provided services for, and they just provide a really wealth of information, um, new ideas that you haven't thought about in the past. So I'd really encourage you to do those. Um, in order to get a credit for attendance, we ask that you fill out the survey evaluation app that is sent out after the session. Um, it just helps us keep these information, these sessions free, gives us a uh, stuff that we can take back to our grantees or grantors to provide information about the success of these sessions. Um, our next session is obviously today. I did not change this slide. So our next session will actually be next Monday at two o'clock where we will be talking about um, some diversity um, in early intervention. Today, I'm going to be talking to us today, uh, all on parent engaged developmental monitoring using the CDC's developmental milestones and checklists. I need to move you, move everybody, because I. Um, so, I my name is Janelle Preston. I am the Act Early um, Ambassador to the state of Utah. I have been the Act Early Ambassador since 2016 here for the state of Utah. I'm also a special educator at the Utah, Utah State University Institute for Disability Research Policy and Practice. I work in um, the early when I work in the service division and part of my job description is the autism specialist in our early intervention program. So today, hopefully what we are going to cover is understanding that children with developmental delays and disabilities are not always identified early. We are looking to improve that system awareness for early identification of developmental delays and disabilities, understand some of the Learn the Science Act early program revisions for the resources, um, and then ways to promote parent-engaged developmental monitoring and surveillance. So the first one is, why do we want to monitor development? And I'm gonna put up a poll that I'm gonna have all of us do. So, and you guys have already started taking it. Obviously, I never closed that 
Bailey when we were practicing it. So if you've not taken a minute, if you'll just go through that poll and answer these first, these seven questions. Looks like the majority of us have. And so this first one, at what age do most babies watch when you move? Um, and so the answer would be two months. Um, and then our next one, at what age, I think that there is a way that I can end this poll and share the results. Can you guys all see the results now? Bailey, I can't see anybody, so we say yes or no. I can see them. Okay. I don't know if others I can, can. also see them. Okay. Yes. So um, this second question, at what age do most babies lift their arms to be picked up? The, some of us said six months, some of us said a year. Um, at nine months is the age at which most babies lift their arms to be picked up. And the next one, at what age do most babies stack at least two small objects? So. We have a range of answers on that one as well. The correct one is 15 months. Um, question number four, at what age do most start jumping um, with both feet off the ground? And again, we have a variety of people that are saying those things. Um, the correct answer um, is 30 months. And the reason why I'm showing you this is really not to say, do we know when milestones happen or when they don't, is that, that sometimes it's really hard to um, remember when all milestones happen. So as professionals, if it's hard or, or challenging for us to remember when those milestones happen or we're unsure, think about it what it's from is from a family's perspective as well. And that's really why I'd like to really just kind of share some of those questions about development. So that's really one of the main reasons why we want to monitor development. It also is because that many children are not identified with developmental delays or disabilities before they start kindergarten, and they really miss out on early intervention services when we know that we are likely to have the biggest impact on child on children's learning. So yeah, um, in the studies, it does show that one in four children under the age of five are at moderate to high risk for developmental, behavioral, or social emotional delays. And that one in six children ages three to 17 has a developmental disability. Um, and the new numbers of autism are that one in 44 are estimated to have autism spectrum disorder. So if we just look at those numbers, we know that developmental delays are just a natural part of everyday life. And we need to always continue to encourage, encourage that. So that is why monitoring development becomes important. It really um, shows that when we can start early intervention at an earlier age, we can um, help support and target those families uh, to get the supports that they need. When we encourage families to engage in that process, um, it helps families um, it helps families to understand that maybe their children may be learning or developing differently. And so just providing um, different strategies to help them understand their child's strengths and um, different supports can strengthen those families' connectiveness and protect them against child abuse and neglect. So there's always four steps of early identification that help children develop new skills and abilities. Um, in order to identify developmental delays and disabilities early, the American Academy of Pediatrics 
recommends that developmental surveillance or monitoring, I'm going to use those two words interchangeably today, um, that those happen at all health supervision visits. Um, parents, early educators, and other early childhood professionals really are also encouraged to monitor child's development and refer those concerns to a healthcare provider to discuss those concerns. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that um, a developmental screening happen for all children at ages 9, 18, and 30 months of age, as well as an autism specific screening at, um, for all children at ages 18 to 24 months. What we all probably know and understand is that not all families attend those regular well child visits. They may miss those at different times or they don't even know that they are supposed to be occurring. So that is really where our role as an early, um, inter early intervention or an early childhood professional comes in in that process to encourage those four steps of early identification. There's also other places that families go to that is a critical point in um, continuing on with the four steps of early identification, like home visiting or WIC programs. Um, sometimes early education and daycare centers um, will also monitor and perform developmental screenings. Families and caregivers are also really important members um, of this early identification team. They're the experts that know their children and are encouraged to monitor their child's development, talk with their child's health care providers, and know about that developmental screening. Um, all of this helps them access those early intervention services. And even once a child is enrolled in early intervention, we don't want to stop the four steps of early identification because we know that when we talk about uh, development, it, once they're in early intervention, we can continue to practice that developmental screening and um, additional diagnoses may be made. So these four steps of early identification are just really um, ongoing and continuing to happen throughout the um, child development years. So we know that developmental monitoring and screening happen and they are, um, they're similar, but there are some key differences. And it's important to understand the strengths and limitations of each, as well as to understand the strengths and limitations of the tools being used to monitor or screen the child's development. So developmental monitoring or surveillance is really um, continuous and it should be ongoing by all early childhood professionals and should engage the family. They are the experts on their child. They know um, it's important for them to not only celebrate what's going on with their child, but to know what to expect next and discuss any questions or concerns that they may have. Uh, developmental surveillance or monitoring is um, built into all well child or health supervision visits but it involves so much more than asking just about developmental milestones. It really is that um, ongoing conversation that includes eliciting and attending to the parent's concerns, maintaining that developmental history, as well as making accurate and informed observations of the child, and then documenting that process, as well as sharing um, the information with the families and other professionals. So that developmental monitoring is a critical piece um, that leads us to surveillance. Developmental monitoring does not provide a score or an at-risk categorization for developmental delays. It is really just that informal piece of it. 
and helps us to know whether or not to take those next steps. Um, a developmental screening, the difference between that is that it is done by an um, early childhood professional, including healthcare early, or early educators. Um, the screening, like monitoring, uses the um, involves the use of developmental milestones. However, the milestones in a screening tool have been studied against diagnostic evaluation tools to de to determine how the scoring of a collection of milestones, not individual milestones, but a collection of them, predicts a delay or disability. So therefore, the screening tool has um, have those known sensitivities and specific. I always get that word wrong. Specificities, but um, the surveillance do not. So some of the ones that we know that we um, typically most people use are the ages and stages, and um, or the M chat. Um, for autism specific. So the screening tool can um, show us that a child might be at risk for a developmental delay and leads us to further evaluations or um, further information or conversations about a formal diagnosis. Uh, so those are the big differences between what monitoring and screening are. We also know that when we do monitoring alone, so just parent engaged developmental monitoring or monitoring of development from professionals, families do not seek out the services. I think it's like at a 3%. And then if they do a developmental screening alone, they only seek out appropriate early intervention services at um, 4%. However, when we do both of those together, the rate of getting um, families to seek out early intervention services almost doubles. So those two pieces come into play together really nicely. So we look at where does CDC's Learn the Signs Act Early program um, and other resources fit into this early identification process. Um, since 2005, CDC um, Learn the Science program has really aimed to change that perception about identifying developmental um, concerns and give parents and professionals the tools to help um, act early if they if, if it, it is needed. So the key components of the campaign are really to continue that ongoing conversation, um, stress the importance of tracking each child's development and encouraging and promoting parent engagement and acting out if they're um, acting early if there are a concern. The checklists have been developed um, with, as a family-friendly adaptation to two publications by the American Academy of Pediatrics to support developmental monitoring or surveillance. They are not to be used for developmental screening, nor are they to be used to replace developmental screening. They are not standards or guidelines. They are really communication tools that aim to promote developmental monitoring and to encourage conversations between parents, doctors, and early child care um, providers about child development. They come in multiple formats. So there is a printable um, PDF uh, that we can hand out checklists during, during um, health supervision visits from two months to five years of age. There is an online digital version for families to complete that they can um, print or email to you as a provider. There's also the Milestone Tracker app with um, checklists so that parents can track their child's um, milestones electronically, as well as that they can email or um, print that out to give 
to you. There's also hard copies if um, families are not, um, do not want an electronic version of it. Once again, all the materials are used to really promote that ongoing conversation about child development. So this is, in, as we know that just developmental monitoring is really only one part of the early identification pro process. Developmental monitoring shows us a long-term approach that really seeks to elicit that parent and caregiver's concerns. Um, it helps us understand what is typical development um, and what may be missing. The Learn the Signs Act early materials um, are just communication tools to engage families and support that conversation. So you may have heard that Learn the Signs Act Early Program recently revised some of its developmental milestones in developmental for de developmental monitoring. So before I start that, I really just want to clarify this misconception that CDC lowered its standards of early childhood development. They did not, the changes made to the milestones do not reflect any observed change in developmental trajectories. They didn't lower any standards, um, nor did they propose any changes in how children are to be evaluated for developmental delays or disabilities. The updates reflect the use of a different method for identifying which milestones to include at certain ages and to improve identification of potential developmental concerns. So with the revisions, it's always important to know the strengths and limitations of the developmental monitoring tools. They were released in February of 2022 that went along with a peer-reviewed article um, that I will share at the end that you can read more information about the revisions, even though the revisions were completed in 2019. So the reasons why there was a delay is that they wanted to make sure that the publication um, went in conjunction with the release of the revisions so that all of us could better understand the revisions and why they were made, um, as well as understanding the strengths and limitations of the milestone checklist. So the revision process was a joint effort in with the American Academy of Pediatrics and CDC's Learn the Signs Act Early program. All the materials are co-branded by both the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics. So with the revisions, the Learn the Science Act Early program really aims to address some of the feedback that have been received over the years from parents and early childhood professionals. Specifically, it was a um, recommendation of providing more clarity about when to take an action on a possible um, developmental concern. That resulted in assigning milestones to ages when most children, 75% or more, would be expected to achieve them. The other recommendation was offering a milestone checklist. At every age, there is um, a well child supervision between 12 months and five years. So that meant adding a checklist for ages 15 and 30 months. The next one was addressing some of the, of the feedback about having vague language or very similar milestones across checklists. So that meant, especially in terms of when to take action. So that meant removing duplicated milestones and milestones only being included in a single list. At any time that a milestone is missing, it should really prompt that parent provider discussion and encourage those next steps, such as a developmental screen. 
So this, the first step was to de develop a criteria um, of which milestones to use and to guide the revision process. So they've de decided on, the experts decided on 11 um, criteria. They said that they all agreed that 75% of more or more of children should be expected to achieve the milestone. So this was decided in order to prevent unnecessary worry, also just decrease that wait and see approach. So if a child is missing a milestone um, and 75% of your peers should be expected to achieve that, it's no longer a wait and see. It is should be considered, let's take that next action. Um, the other thing was that developmental milestones are ones that were relatable for most families and could be observed in everyday settings as opposed to milestones that we use to uh, measure during testing of a ch child. Uh, the milestones should be easy to understand language and the elimination of vague terms like the may, they can, or begins. So um, that was that was eliminated, as well as repetition of check across checklists to reduce any confusion of when a child um, exhibits a milestone. The milestones should also be able to be answered with a yes, not yet, or not sure response. And then the, the milestones were organized in domains to increase awareness that um, children develop in many ways, including cognitive and social emotional uh, development. It's not to say that the milestones only represent skills in within the domain they are listed. Um, experts also agreed that asking the open-ended questions continue to include um, that importance of parents to address um, concerns and discuss things with their uh, early child care professionals. So the reason why 75% or greater was chosen is that is looking at, well, we used to say um, that the 50% or average milestones was used for education and training with early childhood. And then we use that with families. However, it does make us then say, well, should we be concerned? Or we sometimes tell families, well, children develop at their own rate and only 50% of others maybe need Thank you. I'm right over my shoes. Bailey, I can't see somebody. Does somebody have their hand up or? No, I think. Okay. Oh, there she went. Um, so by using the 75%, it's really taking um, that account into saying that it's not no longer that wait and see approach. They wanted to ensure that the milestones were ones that most children would be expected to achieve. And they didn't want a higher goal like 85 to 90 percent because the goal of monitoring and surveillance is really not to replace screening, but it is to um, be able to have those ongoing conversations and catch some of the families that may be at risk for developmental delays, um, that opportunity for developmental um, screening. Uh, the way that the CDC decide, uh, went through the checklist of evaluating the most milestones, milestones is um, a literature search. Uh, they looked at whether there was normative data as well as published clinical opinion. The original milestones 
served as the foundation for the revised milestones, but they did have to find evidence-based um, information about the milestones. There have been some new milestones as well as um, ones that were eliminated because lack of uh, findings on that. Here are the evidence-informed published um, or experts' opinions as they were going through it. I'm not going to go through all of that. Uh, you can review the article if you want to, but one of the big things that it showed us all is that there's not a lot of normative data um, in regards to developmental milestones out there. Um, and that's what they found some of the biggest challenges. So even though there was normative data, there was, um, they would cite a table and in the original um, publication or the other publication, it really was not um, cited. So the other thing is that while it may say that this my milestone represents the average, there really was no percentile or um, there wasn't information about that milestone. And so when uh, that's the, or they would also have a hard time trying to identify which um, milestone it or age it should be. So for example, if 80% of children sit at 7.7 .7 months, then it was had to, decisions had to be made whether to place the milestone at a six month or a nine month of age for the well child visits, because there's not a well child visit at seven, seven months of age. So most of the time when they uh, found something like that, the experts then uh, interpreted the data and determined determined whether to place that when where 75% or more of children would be expected to achieve the milestone. So it's not that the milestones are 75th percentile of milestones. It's really just that they are milestones that the developmental experts felt most children, 75% or more of children would be ex expected to exhibit the milestone. Um, then they looked at, they took those um, milestones and uh, went through and said whether or not they were family friendly and written at a fifth to seventh grade reading level. They tested those with families for things like ease of understanding, word choices, relevance, as well as how would they ask their family and friends about that skill. Um, the testing also included English and Spanish speaking families from di different racial groups, educational levels and income levels. They then um, took those and incorporated the final milestones and had them reviewed by the team and developmental experts. The results of that was that there was a 26% reduction in all milestones. Um, so they, it, they went from two, 216 milestones to 159 milestones. Some of that became, um, the reduction came from duplicated milestones, as well as that there was lack of evidence to support that inclusion. The checklist went on from average of 23 milestones per checklist to 13 per checklist. Um, more than two thirds of the milestones were retained and kept at ages at which they were placed in previous milestones. Although the wording used to describe the milestone may have changed primarily to make it easier to understand. For instance, the old milestone that says say, says several words is now tries to say three or more words besides mama and data. The use of the word several was eliminate, eliminated 
And besides, mama and data was added to improve clarity for parents. Um, there can be, this is the article that I keep referencing is that if you wanna look at more of the revision process, the article is evidence informed milestones for developmental surveillance tools. Um, so that is more e explanation about how the revisions occurred. Um, the additional things that the milestone checklist um, added were ongoing conversations and communication. It gives them um, open-ended questions because milestones can't capture everything. The milestones and checklists also continue to inform parents about routine developmental screening. Um, it informs families how to access early intervention programs throughout their state and encourages parents to share any concerns they may have about their child's development, regardless of whether they are meeting milestones. So it's just another piece to have that ongoing conversation about child development. Um, there's some open-ended questions. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to address is where did the red flags go? Um, by eliminating some of those red flag questions, it is really um, mixed in within the milestones. So the milestones are now 75% um, of children meet those milestones. So if you're not doing that, that automatically becomes a red flag of, of what, that, what your child should be doing. So the uh, red flags were removed. Um, it also, then the checklist also let families know that it's time for that developmental screening um, to ask your uh, healthcare provider or your doctor about that. Um, it adds um, some parenting tips and activities. So there's some great ways that parents can engage um, their families. It really aims to strengthen those families by at, um, providing access to sound parenting information and developmental promotion that's not always readily available to all families. So that some of the strengths is that they really, um, that came out of this process is that these are tools that really improve clarity. Um, it's hopefully to decrease that wait and see approach it does increase that um, support those uh, trusting relationships and support screening as the next step. It's relatable um, families. There were over families from across the United States that participated in the extensive um, process of these milestones. So it's taking that family's perspective from it. They are written at a fifth to seventh grade reading level, and they use family-friendly language. Um, as with any screening tool or any tools that we use as early childhood professionals, it's important to know the strengths and limitations of the resource and tools we use. They are not developmental screeners. They are really meant to support that ongoing conversation um, about child development. They um, are not inclusive of all the milestones a child may exhibit. They are rather that starting point about conversations um, to engage parents in the surveillance process and the ongoing four steps of early identification. Uh, there's some great resources and free materials that are available to early childhood professionals as well as families to just really promote that uh, or normalizing that conversation about development. Um, so some of the take home messages are, is that developmental delays and disabilities are common. We know that we want to identify them earlier. They are 
developmental monitoring and surveillance are complementary to each other, and they really help support that early identification process. The checklists um, are really to support families, to help them engage in this process more often, and that um, regardless of whether of what tools or milestones you are using, it's really important for us to know the strengths and limitations of them all, and to always encourage that parents are a huge part of this process. So the mission of the Learn the Science is more than just the materials. It is really to improve develop, um, early identification, increase that four steps of awareness so that families can get the supports and services they need. So we integrate those into WIC agencies, into Early Head Start, as well as um, healthcare visits. This was a conjunction in um, in conjunction with the American Academy of Pediatrics. And so there's a lot of resources and supports for um, healthcare providers, as well as early intervention providers to understand how developmental monitoring and surveillance enhances and strengths our next steps for uh, screening and developmental processes. So a few of the fun resources that are out there are, of course, um, there is children's books, there are checklists, they are translated into many different languages. If at any point you want some of these materials or would like to look at them, please reach out to me. I have some on hand that I can send out, um, as well as you can order them from CDC's webpage. We have a Utah-specific uh, social media uh, that we share some information about the milestones on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I'm going to um, open up to any questions that any of you may have. Okay, hey, well, if there are no other questions, then I am going to, Jordan Thomas is who is going to be doing our case presentation for us today. And you should be able to share your screen, Jordan. I, I did have one question. Yep. Um, I couldn't unmute quick, no, quick enough. Sorry. Uh, so you're talking about all these changes that CDC has made. Um, how are are they going to be printing up new, you know, um, screening tools like, you know, DP3, Vitell, you know, Violin? Are they going to be changing those or how does this work? So the developmental screening tools have not been um, changed or updated. Developmental screening tools are once again more, they have, um, They've looked at groups of milestones and how they might promote or, or identify a developmental delay or disability. The checklists are just that process to support that ongoing conversation with it. So it's not that they revised a lot of it. They really took away some of that vague language um, they made sure that they are in ages where 75% or more of children could do, would be doing those. And so instead of saying um, a child may begin walking, they now have that a child um, may, it, the, a child should take three or four steps at this age. And then if a child's not, that warrants additional screening. That answer your question. Yes, thank you. And the the updated or revised milestones are out um, available on the CDC's website. They've been um, on the CDC's website since February of 2020.
Any other questions? The biggest, I'm just going to say one of the biggest takeaways is just to say that um, the milestones are part of that uh, ongoing conversation. They're meant to supplement that, encourage that, and help families participate in that conversation. All right, Jordan. All right. Can everybody hear me okay before I start sharing my screen? Perfect. Thank you. Um, so today I am going to be giving um, a presentation, um, a case presentation about one of the kiddos that I work with. Um, background on this case is that uh, she is a three, 30 month old female who is nonverbal and has no purposeful communication other than crying. Um, she cannot sit up on her own, cannot crawl and is not holding things in either her hands or her arms. Uh, she has not yet eat solid foods and is bottle fed. Um, the family has come, came here to the United States from the Marshall Islands several years ago, um, but they still speak only Marshallese in the home. Um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech and language pathology have all attempted to meet with the family at least twice a month. Um, that's usually hit or miss, and we only get about maybe one visit from one of those providers each month. Um, our assistive technology specialist has also tried to see this family multiple times and has not yet been successful. Um, that has changed. She did get in this last month and they are starting a communication board. Um, that was some updated information that I have not been able to include on here yet. Um, all services are provided in the child's home, but the family only keeps about 60% of their appointments on a good month. Um, usually it's less than that. Mom and dad can understand a little bit of English. An older brother who's 23 years old will interpret some of the visits, but is not always there in the home or always willing to interpret those visits for his parents. Um, we have tried to use over the phone interpretation, um, but the company that we've been using now has told us that we need to schedule at least 48 hours in advance for a Marshallese speaking interpreter. Um, and there's been several visits where we schedule at least 48 hours in advance, um, sometimes up to two weeks in advance, and the company will will call the company the time that we've scheduled the appointment and everything and confirmed with the family, and there's not a Marshallese interpreter available. Um, as well as the program we've had posted for several months, the uh, Marshallese interpreter position open specifically for um, this family and another family that speak Marshallese in our program and have not had any applicants. Um, the family does consist of mom and dad, a 23 year old brother, a 16 year old, a 12 year old, this 30 month year old female, 30 month old, excuse me, female, and an 18 month old child. Um, and the biggest concern is that the 18 month old is meeting all of their milestones faster than the 30 month old and the, the parents are concerned as to, to what's going on there. The pediatrician was the one that referred this child to the early intervention program and is very concerned about some diagnoses or disorders on there just due to some of the global delays that are happening with this child. Um, but there has not been any specific testing done. Um, every time that they have tried to do any testing, specifically genetic or neurological testing, the family has not shown up to those visits or will not follow up and confirm those visits with the specialists that are trying to complete the testing. Um, the last visit that I was able to have with the family um, with some broken English, they did note that they were interested in those testing um, and wanting to continue those. And I have reached out to the pediatrician on multiple occasions and they have informed me that they will follow up on that, but I have not heard anything back since then. Um, but that um, he had noticed on here that the family, um, he did say that he would readdress that this next visit and knows that the family is interested in that, but is kind of at a loss at that point and doesn't know what else to do. Um, our primary area of concern is that um, they have so many missed appointments and they miss out on those opportunities to implement the strategies and helps that we have for this family. Um, and the biggest fear that we have is that they're not fully understanding the information that we are giving them in any of those appointments that they do keep. Um, and then the inconsistent Marshallese interpretation is just kind of that biggest one, which ties into the, the one previous to where we just aren't entirely sure that they do understand everything that we're saying. Um, the assistive technology um, provider here in our program did let me know 
just last week that mom has started a new job and is having to speak a little bit more English and is seeming to do better, but still prefers Marshallese um, to be the main language and the main language of contact for them. Um, and then again, the biggest area is just that the primary, the child is not getting any of that help that, that we need due to some of these barriers and the biggest concerns that we have. So our goals are just to help sure, make sure that the family keeps their appointments and understand what we're telling them, um, even if that might be having it or using a consistent interpreter and to help the child as best we can while also considering the family culture, not just specifically the culture they come from, but specifically what's happening in their family and within their home. Um, the biggest barriers, again, are those missing appointments and that uh, it's hard to find a Marshallese interpreter. And then the outcomes that have not yet been met or the ones that we're really working on with this child, or at least trying to work on with this child, um, are to help her participate in family routines by pointing, participating in mealtimes by eating purees rather than just being bottle fed, participating in playtime by crawling and also sitting up alone or sit staying in a sitting position alone. Um, so what we would like some help on as a team here is um, if any of you have worked with the Marshallese population before, have, uh, are there anything that has been helpful or that you've utilized that has helped them with their understanding or keeping appointments even? Um, any other resources for Marshallese speaking families, uh, potential outside services outside of the pediatrician and early intervention services, or if there's any other Marshallese interpreter or Marshallese interpretation services offered or provided? Um, so any questions or any concerns? I have a question and I can't figure out how to raise my hand on here for some reason. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, my question is how are they getting the medical services with the language barrier? Are they getting translation for from the medical provider or how are they understanding that? That's a great question. I'm not entirely sure, but as far as I'm aware, they just go and do it in English. They may take older brother or rather older brother may be the one that's taking the child. I'm not entirely sure, but as far as I know, all of the medical and everything that's treated with the pediatrician has been done in English, not in Marshallese. That could be a huge reason for the so many missed appointments. I don't think if I understood what was going on with my child, like what they wanted to do, I probably wouldn't take them either. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I didn't know if that would be any help or not. Mm -hmm. How many people are trying to get into Sam? So we have, as of right now, four providers that are trying to get into the see, see them. Uh, three of the providers have requested that they go two times a month and the other one is just one time a month. So it's a lot of visits and that's kind of a big thing that we've talked about as a team is backing out on those visits. Okay. But the family, every time we bring it up, again, it's in English or the first time I brought it up, it was with the Marshallese interpreter, but the answer the family gave was, it didn't align with the question. So again, we weren't sure that it was exactly what the interpreter understood what we were asking. But when I followed up again in English, um, the family did state that they wanted to keep the services as they were and keep trying that many visits because they, again, have noticed the developmental delay and the significance of delay between the 18 month old and the 30 month old. Right. And the gap just keeps getting wider. Exactly. Yeah, because it just sounds so overwhelming mm -hmm. to me that maybe they just kind of when they get to that point and then they just want to give up because it's too much. But could they maybe do some, like, maybe have, I think what Rihanna was talking about, maybe have one contact person helping them schedule all those visits instead of having to schedule multiple, like, I, I don't have a language barrier, and I get really overwhelmed when I'm having to make multiple appointments for my kids, but if someone were to sit down and say, let's schedule this day, this day, these things, maybe that would help. Or team visits, you know, yeah, you cool. go out with the OT and. So is it different in Utah that you guys all go out separately versus like in North Dakota, we all go together, like whether it be the home visitor, the speech pathologist and the occupational <laughs> therapist, we all go out, out, out at the same time. Oh, we do both. In Utah? We okay. do both. Yeah. So sometimes we have simultaneous and sometimes we have separate okay so Jordan is that how you guys do that you guys all go together 
we usually, it depends on what the providers are doing in the visits. A lot of times they'll go separately and do their own visits. If it is a case like this, we have tried to do several co-visits where the occupational therapist and the physical therapist will go together and be working potentially on similar outcomes or strategies. Yeah. Um, but every time we've tried that, it ends up being a no-show where the family does not come to the door. So. Oh, that's, oh, that's, I, it's, I'm just thinking, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. And how frustrating is it that they say that they want the services, but there's no follow through with it and you don't know mm-hmm. how to fix it. Right. And and going on that as well as where several of them are trying to see them twice a month, they will keep maybe one appointment a month. And so it's not like we can contact them and really say, hey, you're not meeting services because they are receiving at least partial services, even though it may not be the full services that they have specifically requested when we first proposed that in the initial plan that we proposed to them. They're all really good um, responses. How many of you guys have ever worked with the Marshallese population? Anybody have any insights on how they have been successful? The only one, I I can only think of a similar one. I had one family that only spoke Mandarin and we made it work with body language and broken English on the mom. The mom had a little bit of English and the rest of it was a lot of like modeling and acting out. And there, there was a lot of, surprisingly enough, a lot of understanding, but I just feel like in this situation, it is so, so different because it's just not a, you know. Yeah, it just like like from our conversation from last week where we were talking about some of those health disparities, does Marshallese families um, not like value or see those <laughs> developmental delays or disabilities or um, something like that. I just uh, was wondering if any of you guys had come across something with that. And then Whitney says that they have a similar situation and they use an ant. How does that work for you, Whitney? It works really well if the ant is there. If the ant is not there, it's incredibly difficult. It sounds like um, my family understands a little bit more English um, than Jordan's, but yeah, it's the same situation where very difficult to get into the home, um, hit or miss with visits. And this little guy has bilateral microophthalmia. So he just has light perception only and I work for Utah schools for the deaf and blind. So I'm set to see him three times a month due to the his intensive needs. And it's just, it's tricky, tricky, tricky. Are you able to use a different um, interpretation service? Like I know you said you had like the online interpretation. Is there, do you have the option to choose a different one that might be a little bit more consistent? Um, I think we probably would, as far as I'm aware, um, I haven't really looked into that, but I do know as far as what we've looked into, that's been really one of the only ones that's been helpful with doing that, or at least has offered that here. Um, but I, I do know that there was another provider that had looked into some other interpretation services that were offered or other companies that have been offered. Um, I will probably need to follow up on that, but as far as I know, that was the only one that would offer either virtual or over the phone interpretation that here. So because I know Crystal and Marla are both program coordinators, what suggestions do you guys have for your providers when they have issues like this or concerns? Crystal. Um, my team's been talking, so uh, we we looked for an interpreter service. We've been creative in the past. Um, 
who used a bodybuilder but was a return missionary spoke a language once that somebody randomly ran into um but yeah there are multiple online or call-in interpreter services so maybe that would be helpful um what was my other thought oh you know you can google translate and get approximate um we did that with like our prior notices and things so that we had some materials i would give to the interpreter but we had also google translate it before i went into the visit which helped a little bit to be prepared with something that the family could refer to um i'm wondering though my my husband's romanian and we use like google or um, not google uh, facebook messenger and i wonder if they have a relative even out of the country that speaks English that might be able to help a little bit too. Um, I know I've, I've kind of helped interpret for things in Romania as long as we get the right time. I'm trying out. to think of like how they got here and who, who were their contacts to get here. You know, maybe kind of going back and finding and maybe there is somebody that can be a go between I don't know if there would be funding for that or if somebody would be able to do it out of the goodness of their heart, but whoever their connection was to get here to live. Does that even make sense? I'm sorry, I feel like I'm rambling, but. No, it does no. for sure. Yeah. Have any of you guys ever found success in working with the refugee centers that some of the families come through? In your areas? Janelle, since you asked me to comment and I might have to jump off here in a minute, I'll share my thoughts, but it, um, we have an English language center in Logan that we have sometimes been able to find translators and, and um, a little more information about individual cultures, because sometimes that's, that's it too, because I want to say, I might be wrong, but I think the family that Jordan was talking about has a, and maybe you mentioned this, a, a sibling of this child, a teenager who sometimes translates for us as when we come to the home. And I think sometimes, um, you know, we are such a, a family-centered early intervention system and culturally understanding too what priorities are for families from, from wherever they're from and how scheduling works in their family, let alone in their culture, is a, is a big part of what we all try to do to be there when they are ready and ready to learn and in a way that works for them. And some, that's a trick. I would be open to tips on that. Yeah, and then I was just looking at some of the things that are coming in on the chat, Jordan. There is mm -hmm. um, a cultural yeah. on call. Yeah, I, I was just looking at those too, and I was I'm clicking on these links and looking at them too as people are talking but uh to kind of back up on that and you're right becky that google translate does not offer marshallese which has been a big one because we we thought about using that as well um and and that's one that we had talked about potentially using or offering to the family but where it's not offered we couldn't use that um and then brenda they do have a phone where we could text them and, and message them um and i've done that they actually do respond a little bit better to a text for scheduling than they do a phone call because then they can contact the older sibling and have them read it to them and translate or interpret that for them during that visit or whenever they have time to do that and then respond. Um, and then I, I, like I did say, I, I do want to follow up again with the pediatrician and just see, I have not even thought about the, if they're receiving pediatrician visits in English or Marshallese and reaching out to them and see if that would be an option as well and if we could use their same interpreter if they are using interpretation for those visits um and then i haven't thought about any cultural club or anything like that but i could definitely look into that for here um to the the college that's close by to us or anything that way or even look at like facebook groups that are potentially offered um for that culture or community or like janelle was saying the refugee help mm -hmm would be a good source. It's pretty rare, Marshallese, like. And you said there's a 16-year-old sibling? Yeah, 
are mm-hmm. they able to interpret for you at all? Obviously, they're not going to be there during like school hours, but. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure. I, from what I understood, the provider said it was the older brother, who I believe is the 23 year old who's still living in the home. But again, the, they may not even still be living in the home since last time I've seen them. They, they could have moved out by then. Um, I believe we've talked about the 16 year old in there, but where it was the provider didn't feel quite comfortable asking the 16 year old in that situation to do that just where they were a minor and where it was a little bit confusing. Um, he, I know the provider did say something about mom or dad needing someone to interpret them for them. And they said they would prefer it, but the 16 year old was just sitting on the other side of the wall and could hear everything that was happening and did not offer to come and and interpret or anything that way. They just kind of, stayed out of it and that's when the provider said that I they didn't really feel comfortable pressing the 16 year old into doing that whereas the 23 year old who did speak fairly good English and could was interpreting for them in the past they felt a little bit better about that and and things that way but it just they didn't push too hard for that one How about, does anybody know, you guys have given all great ideas about the translation and interpreting. Does anybody know about resources for Marshallese speaking families on top of what we've already shared? I mean, there has to be some somewhere. It's just the problem of finding them, you know? Yeah, or anybody have any good go-to places or um, information for just different um, cultures, not maybe not specifically Marshallese. I do wonder, Jordan, so um, Michigan, there you said, Um, has a, or not Michigan, Minnesota has a great family to family connection unit. And they have, I think I've shared that with you for um, Somalia as well as Latinx. I'm wondering if they have anything on Marshallese and that could be also a good resource for just understanding um, resources for Marshallese. Does anybody know if our family to family network here in Utah or Shelby, does yours in um, yours have like ways to connect different families? I know we used to, but I think for lack of participation from family is, I'm not sure that it's been funded anymore. Does anybody know about the family to family network in Utah or Idaho? Two years ago, I'd asked about Spanish, and it was um, a consideration. It was at a consideration point, but it, I don't think it was anything up and running. So I don't know that we do. Okay. And I think Marshallese is a challenging one, but all of these issues kind of come up with many dual language families. So ideas and things that you have for. I've never thought about that cultural club. That's, that might be something really good to look into just because um, we are on a university campus. And I, I cut out for a minute, so. I, I, maybe this already got asked, but I know that we need to provide services in the area that the family resides, but is there any way to, I mean, were they getting any sort of early intervention or are there an early intervention services provided in the area that they moved from? Is there a way to do a virtual connection with them and work together? 
And that's a good question. As far as I know, they have not been in early intervention or excuse me, early head start or anything like that um, for another area or another um, environment that we could provide services. Um, I think the only other one, just where there is such an age gap between siblings and things, the, the other siblings are in school or working. It's just that this kiddo and the, the younger kiddo, they they stay at home. Um, and then if mom or dad are at work or both are at work, then one of the older siblings takes care of her and watches her while they're gone. So there isn't a daycare, there isn't early head start, there isn't another situation where she could be elsewhere to provide those services. But so I will also look for that and share that if I can find that because there may be an act early ambassador in the Marshallese Islands. I mean, there are one for almost every state and territory, but they could also provide some ideas of how to connect. That was a great idea. Thanks for sharing that, Erica. Yeah, I was just thinking I'd be on the phone to someone that's in those islands trying to figure out who can help virtually there's got to be a way in a situation like that it can be facilitated i mean and this 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 family needs that help yeah and then i don't so kim can you explain i am not sure i know that resource that you're talking about the pick to r to explain that to all of us so oh, yes, PICTAR is a Pacific Islander nonprofit that helps Marshallese, um, Pacific Islanders, Hawaiians, you name it. Uh, they also have like groups for teens. They have um, empowerment groups for women, also for men. They talk about domestic violence. They help them with that. So yeah, um, I don't know if you know Susie. Susie from PICTAR, she is a director. She was actually on the news. She was the one who got bit by the spider 12 times. So, but yeah, they do a lot with the Marshallese community. And I know they were trying to help them like two weeks ago, they were trying to get in contact with someone from the community to try to get them on Medicaid because we are one of the Medicaid plans and I know um, they, they can get insurance. So, but um, I could get you a contact for the Marshallese community and also from PICTAR. Yeah, that would be certainly helpful for that. And then Crystal sharing, um, has the family been connected with respite care and reaching out to DDI Vantage because they work with a lot of refugee groups. Um, Crystal, do you have like a contact that Jordan could reach out to for at DDI? Would it just be the program coordinator? Yeah, Megan Boyd is probably, I think the one that helps connect people with that. Another out of the box thought I just had is maybe you could find it through a travel agency. They might have a contact that might know about interpreters or something. I don't know, it's kind of out of the box. More it's okay, at this point, out of the box is kind of what we need, so. <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. Like, you go, jump right out of that box. We're gonna find something. Those are great suggestions and um, ideas for for all of this. So we'll save those in um, on those recommendations, Jordan, as well as I'll save those in a chat. Anybody else have anything that um, to provide for feedback or ideas for Jordan's case? I was uh, thinking about the teenagers and uh, the younger kids, if they're going to school, there, there must have been some way in which they got help when they first started school there. How long ago was it that they came here? And, you know, if maybe not the 16 year old helping, but maybe somebody helped them. So maybe there's a way of talking to the school and find out how they got help learning English if they, you know, cause they, I'm sure if they're, wherever they're going to school, they gotta know English or else someone helped them to learn English. And maybe that would be also 
trying to help find somebody to help them learn English rather than just get an interpreter. That's kind of instead of just teaching them how to fish, you know, teach them, give them a fish. Why not teach them how to fish and teach them how to speak English? Yeah, that's a great suggestion too. I wanted to make a comment about being super respectful to their culture as well, because I feel like um, you can misunderstand language and misunderstand culture, and those are two different things. So if you can really focus on being respectful of their culture, even if you can't communicate in the same language, if you can show the respect for their culture, you might be able to have better success in in communicating with them. Well, and I was also thinking that I'm sure that you could print out information online that's in their language to help facilitate that in the meantime. And I would also use a lot of visuals and pictures. Like if you're trying to teach a strategy to do with the children, and which sounds like with PT and that, like take actual pictures of the sequencing, you know, one at a time, like here's the PT holding the child this way or doing this, doing that, like the sequencing. And rather than writing it out or giving verbal instructions, like having actual like printed pictures for them to look at and refer to, just like we would with a child who's learning language. And Yeah, that's a good, interesting idea. I've not, wouldn't have ever thought about that. So see why you guys are all brilliant in this knowledge and why we come to all of you guys for ideas because that's a great one. And I think Jennifer, your point of making sure and to understand their culture, um, is also really critical. Okay, well, great ideas. And thank you very much for um, sharing that, um, that those recommendations and those suggestions for Jordan. It really is, you know, like I said, you guys bring a wealth of knowledge and ideas to um, things that people don't always think about, just even thinking outside the box and kind of gets us all thinking. So thank you for participating in today's ECHO. Um, again, next week, we will be hearing from um, it from a family's perspective or a family provider who um, is a native Latinx uh, family that is going to share um, ways to integrate and include families in that perspective. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. And Bailey just popped in um, the survey link. So if you wanted to click on that and take a minute to complete the survey, that'd be fantastic. Thank you for providing this. It's very, very good for all of us. Thank you for attending. Everybody have a great afternoon.